Hans Blix, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Uh, the doomsday clock, that metaphorical clock which is supposed to show how close we are to the end of the world, was set by scientists this week at three minutes to midnight, uh, the closest to midnight it's been since 1984. How worried are you by the prospect of nuclear war? Well, I think the clock reminds us that in addition to the some 20,000 nuclear warheads that you find in the US and Russia and the traditional nuclear weapon states, we also have countries like North Korea that are moving on and even testing, which the other states are not doing. So, yes, it is a real concern. And if they were to develop long-range missiles too, yes, it would be even more worrying. They do claim to have carried out their fourth nuclear weapons test uh, at the start of this year, a miniaturized hydrogen bomb which panicked a lot of people. How panicked are you by that? How worried should we be? How seriously should we take the North Korean nuclear weapons program? I think we should take it seriously, <coughs> perhaps not necessarily because of this particular test or that shows that they are advancing. But we have, for many years, we have had talks with them, we have sanctions and uh, talks in Beijing with the six powers and nothing seems to have worked. And the query is, can one design a strategy uh, to get to results? Uh, the uh, North Koreans may be looking at uh, Gaddafi and they may look at uh, Saddam and say, what happened to him when, and them when they gave in? Well, they both disappeared. You know that the US has also on occasion offered North Korea that they could have a peace treaty. That would be an important part because they identify the US as their big enemy. However, that may not have been enough. They may ask themselves, what is the better for their safety and security? Is it a paper guarantee from the US or a bomb? Uh, I think you need more than just a peace treaty with, with the US. And I think the Chinese, as rightly, I think, is, are identified in the US and elsewhere as a key player because the North Koreans are dependent upon them. So I think the, the permanent members of the Security Council, in particular the US and Russia and China, and here added with Japan, of course, and South Korea, will have to work very closely together. You mentioned the United Nations and the Security Council. There's that famous scene in the 2004 movie Team America World Police. I'm not sure if you've seen it where Kim Jong-il's character <laughs> feeds your character of course. to the sharks. And it's supposed to show how weak and toothless the UN and weapons yeah. inspectors such as yourself are in the face of brutal dictators. Uh, that's a fair point, isn't it? Well, it's, I mean, I thought it funny. It, that, that was the thing that made me famous in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I don't think they're right because actual, op actual observations have a role to play. When we were in Iraq, and we reported that we had not seen any, nu any nuclear or other weapons of mass destruction. It wasn't taken seriously by Washington, but it turned out that we were closer to the truth than anybody else. Now that's a sad thing, and I think everybody recognizes that it would be wise to listen to international inspectors because they are on ground and they are independent and they are professional. Uh, Iran has agreed to a historic uh, nuclear agreement last year, uh, which includes uh, what's been described uh, as the most robust inspection regime ever negotiated. Are you a supporter of the Iran nuclear deal, or do you think it's too soft on Tehran? No, I think it is a very good deal, and I take off my hat to uh, uh, Kerry and to Lavrov and to uh, Zarif of Iran for their patience and for Catherine Ashton. All of them did show that diplomacy did work, but it also cost a lot for the U.S. presidency of Obama and Kerry. It cost a lot in, the, in terms of, of action with the opposition. And in Iran, too. I think that the Rouhani and Zarif have a hard, hard time with the conservatives on, on that side. What has now happened through this agreement is that Iran has committed itself to scale down the program very drastically. They will have only so and so many centrifuges, etc. Very severe scaling down, down to a level which will be sort of understandable in terms of, use of peaceful uses of nuclear energy. They have made great concessions. The US has committed itself to stop punishing Iran. I don't see that as a very great concession. I think the agreement is, is very, very great progress. And I should also remember that Russia played an important role in this. We often talk about Russia and their, their acting in, in the Ukraine against the UN Charter, etc. This is true. This is a right, right criticism. But at the same time, we saw that in the case of Syrian chemical weapons, Russia helped the US to solve this situation. And now, in the case of Iran, they're also helpful. And we are hoping that there will be some beginning to a solution of the Syrian 
civil war where Russia will help. What about those critics of the Iran deal? For example, the Prime Minister of Israel and every single Republican presidential candidate uh, who say it's a bad deal, it's a weak deal, uh, that it merely puts things on hold for 10 years, after which Iran will be able to freely carry on as it was before with its uranium enrichment program. The U.S. thinks that they can switch on sanctions any moment, but I, they, must, they must be aware that they are not alone in this game. It's also the rest of the world. It's sanctions from the Security Council and the European Union. In, Euro in Europe, there are not far less qualms about the agreement with Iran, much more enthusiasm. When you were running the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Authority, uh, that organization took a lot of steps to address, to tackle, to challenge, to investigate Iran's alleged nuclear weapons program. Uh, what did it ever do about Israel's actual nuclear weapons program? Well, nothing really, because Israel in the first place has not uh, adhered to the non-proliferation treaty. Israel is not obliged to stay away from nuclear weapons under any international commitment. They were they certainly disappointed Nixon and the United States and the world in, in making a nuclear weapon, but it was not a breach of the law. Actually, Iran could theoretically have done the same thing. They could also have withdrawn from the non-proliferation treaty, and then what they had been doing would have been legal. I think it remains a big problem that Israel has nuclear weapons and that in the long run, a zone free not only weapons of mass destruction but also of uh, installations to produce high enriched uranium or plutonium should go away but that's certainly not where we are today uh, the scientists behind the doomsday clock when they're calculating how close we may be to the end of the world uh, they obviously also look at the threat from climate change uh, 2015 was the hottest year on record according to the united nations is climate change a bigger threat in your view uh, than nuclear war or even international terrorism I am confess I'm more worried about the climate change because the nuclear, we have now managed to live for 70 years without a further nuclear uh, war exploded in, in war, war time. Whereas in the case of the global warming, we are dealing with 7 billion people who are trying to use a lot of nuclear, a lot of power in the future. I mean, oddly in a way, nuclear energy plays a role in both situations. In the case of the bomb, of course, it's nuclear energy that gives it explosive force. In the case of the global warming, nuclear energy in the form of nuclear power, nuclear power plants, may interestingly be one important part of the solution. I think we should be very pleased that China and India are going full scale ahead with nuclear power because that gives them huge chunks of electricity. It's not without problems, I'm not saying that, and no energy generation is without some problems, but this certainly is an existing means of generating huge amounts of energy without adding to the greenhouse gases. In the United States and other Western countries, people, are, people seem to be much more worried these days about the possibility of a terrorist attack from a group uh, such as ISIL, uh, rather than the threat from climate change. ISIL is now dominating uh, the headlines. You, of course, were deeply involved in the run-up uh, to the Iraq war in 2003 as the chief UN weapons inspector. Had the United States and the UK and others not invaded Iraq, would we have the ISIL threat that we have today? Would ISIL even exist in your view? I think it is doubt doubtful that it would have ex existed because many of their cadres came from people who were dissatisfied Sunnis. In Iraq, the Shiites came to power and the Sunnis were sort of ostracized and many of them joined the ISIS. So that was an important element of, of the sad evolution that we have had. I think the, neither I Iraq, Libya or Syria they all show the difficulty of doing something from the outside. You, you may say that if you hadn't done this, then Saddam would have been there, uh, Gaddafi would have been there. But I think one should ask the people there, not we in the West, we should ask the people there, which would you prefer? Do you prefer tyranny to anarchy or vice versa? They got rid of tyranny, but they got anarchy. I think many anarchy Iraqis would still horrible. say today they prefer uh, a life without Saddam than with Saddam. Oh, I think so too. But do, do they prefer anarchy to tyranny? Do you ever feel regret, uh, maybe guilt even, that you weren't able to speak out and stop the Iraq invasion from happening? In the years since, you've effectively accused uh, Bush and Blair of lying about the WMD threat, but you didn't say that at the time when it might have made a difference had you taken a stronger stance. Well, the basic difficulty is that you cannot prove the negative. I could not say in 2003, that hey, there are no 
no chemical weapons or no biological weapons. I was quite convinced there were no nuclear weapons, but I could not say that because they are so small, they could be hidden, and they would have said, if I said, we, have been we don't find any, they would say, have you looked here, have you looked there, etc. So you cannot, if you are asked objectively to report about this situation, ever say, no, there is absolutely nothing. You cannot prove the negative. I think they should have understood that the likelihood was very little that anything remained. We went to lots of sites that were recommended to us by the U.S. intelligence and British intelligence as, as likely places for, for weapons of mass destruction. And we reported to them that no, in none of these cases did we find any weapons of mass destruction. So I think we said at the time rightly that if this was the best they had, what was the rest? Did you know at the time or did you believe at the time that they were misrepresenting the intelligence, that they were not telling the truth? Yes, I think when I listened to Colin Powell, I was a bit amazed at it. Now, many of the things that he reported were things we could not check and did not know. There were telephone calls that were be had been listened to, etc. And But some others sounded odd, and I said so in the Security Council. And I also warned both the U.S., Condoleezza Rice, and Blair that we were not at all impressed by, by the evidence. And I said to Blair that it wouldn't be, be paradoxical if you invaded Iraq with 250,000 men and found that there were no weapons of mass destruction. Hans Blix, thanks for joining me on Upfront.